So thinking about, I want us to just talk briefly um, and please do like interrupt. You can unmute yourself and interrupt if you have questions or need clarification, like total freedom, no formality here. So um, I, I would love to go in depth on a ton of scripture, Be but truly it is such a vast <laughs> subject that um, I'm going to give a lot of references. Feel free. I mean, I will send out the PowerPoint if that's helpful to you, but screenshot or whatever, um, if you'd like to go back. But I just want to give us a few um, frameworks that hopefully will help as we go into like really just practicing. Um, okay, so kind of opening with the question of when we're talking about hearing God's voice, what can we expect? Like, like what are we allowed to expect? Um, so kind of diving into a, a very fly-by biblical theology. Um, before Jesus, so Old Testament, kind of Old Covenant, we get a couple of really like, I mean, we could talk about this forever, but I just want to highlight a few characteristics of God's voice. So God's voice um, from the beginning, Genesis 1, is not just powerful, but creative. And if you're familiar at all with like speech act theory, which is a, a kind of critical lens in literary theory, um, connecting like how speech like relates to action, for God, speech is action. So God speaks the world into being, right? Like that there is like no space between God's speech and, and what happens between God saying something is happening and it happening. Um, but we do see this, of course, you know, after the fall, but just in general, as, as history unfolds in the biblical narrative, that God's voice is, is unpredictable, I think is a good way to talk about it. Um, that, that everyone is surprised when they hear it with a few notable exceptions. I think Moses would be probably the most notable, um, David, right? But in general, there's this sense of, of God's speech being really special, serious, heavy, and confined to like a few situations, people, right? Those kinds of things. Um, his, interestingly, his speech identifies his presence more than seeing God. So um, that this is untrue. If you think about like that, that might seem obvious, or it might just seem like something you've never thought about. In the ancient world, the gods were seen, right? Like there would be a manifestation of a god, right? An idol um, of something made out of stone or cast in gold, right? But for, for the god of the Hebrews, right? For Yahweh, God is actually, like what characterizes God is his speech, which is fascinating. Um, it was concentrate, God's speech was particularly concentrated in his people, like that he calls out beginning with Abraham, um, for sure. And then in the, the nation of Israel, right? They're the people who sort of own God's speech in a sense, right? Like they um, hear his voice, they um, are the ones with the prophets and the priests and kings who are speaking to them. And in fact, you, we do see interesting instances where God is speaking through prophets of Israel to other nations, right? So there's even this represented factor. Um, it's most often to the community, right? Spoken a few times to very specific people, but always with a broad implication. So even when he promises something to Abraham, there's a sense of like, this is for those who come after you, right? Um, so it doesn't have this sort of like, maybe you you think about like sort of the new age, um, or even like what we kind of get in popular culture. There's no such thing as like your truth, like your personal God that tells you personal things. Like that wasn't actually like a, a really a concept in the ancient world. Um, and it certainly wasn't something that we see, um, with God, right? Like that, that there is in general sort of a broad scale application um, to God's speech. Of course, there are a few exceptions, but in general. And, and certainly that God's speech carries an expectation of obedience, that to hear God speak is to also be in a, a place of needing to obey, right? Needing to respond appropriately. Um, okay, so 
another question what does god's speech do exactly like how does it function <laughs> um a few things i mean we could go on and on about this but certainly like warns we get a lot of like warning from god to um disobedient israel to shepherds right like like those who are in leadership who are disobeying um it directs it reveals right we get this language of sort of like pulling back the curtain, um, certainly comforts and promises. Um, it's how God introduces himself, right? He speaks um, in order that people would know who he is, um, that there's a sense in which like God's people are dependent upon his speech to know him, um, that he announces the future. Um, this is one of my favorite ones that he, uh, the, he speaks in metaphors often I think about like this passage in Ezekiel is like God saying, hey, Ezekiel, who's a prophet in the Old Testament, he basically says, go build a tiny city and act out a siege as like a demonstration to Israel that they're going to be under siege, right? And you can just imagine this poor guy who's like etching Jerusalem in silhouette onto like a brick, right? That there's a sense of like, God is often like saying, to his people, hey, do this weird thing so that people can look at it and as like a sort of skit, right? Or like a, a way of um, imagining an outcome that God is either promising or warning about. Um, remember that these are not, people aren't reading their Bibles, right? Like this is a very communal, very oral culture. And so um, God's word is being spoken and received into the particular limitations around um, literacy and that kind of thing at the time. Okay, still so gone. I think most importantly, when we talk about God's speech, what we're talking about is like how we know that God is present. So in scripture, God's speech is important, not just because it's important, but because when God is speaking, he's there right? Um, and that there becomes this deep connection between hearing and knowing. So when we're talking about the voice of God, I want us to sort of expand the idea of like the language of God or anything like that into like in the same way that if, you know, Tyler, if we were like, hey, Tyler, what does your mom's voice sound like? right? Like Tyler knows his mom's voice. Like, I don't know what Tyler's mom sounds like, right? But, but Tyler knows his mom's voice, but I could hear her voice today. And then I would know what she sounded like, right? But Ty Tyler doesn't just know his mom's voice. He knows his mom, right? And, and that's just one part of kind of how she manifests in the world. And so this kind of question of like how do we understand like God's speech as presence I think becomes something we really need to hang on to um, into the future as we think about sort of the biblical theology around this okay another obvious question how does God speak um there are all kinds of ways would love you guys to like use the chat to talk about things that like just come to mind around that question. Um, this was just the, my very quick list um, of all of which we see in scripture. Um, I'm gonna suggest that they also, they're not confined to scripture, um, but that, that these are some ways um, that we see God speaking. So visions, sort of like dr dreams while you're awake, it's kind of the idea. Um, so something playing out, dreams, emotions, so like a really strong feeling that can be prompted, um, an audible voice. So we hear God talking about his emotions, right? And that that's like a way of him expressing himself, um, an audible voice, metaphor, um, certainly through others, right? God mediates his voice through Moses. He mediates his voice through the prophets, through David, through Samuel, um, Yes, all of those things. Um, impressions. Um, well, oh, sorry. Uh, I'll, yeah, 
I'm going to speed through here, but also dreams, obviously, um, simile. So God saying like, Hey, it's like this, right? So, um, God talking about and revealing things through it, their connection to other things. Um, yes. So then we get, this is my like biblical theology at a glance. We get, um, Jesus showing up. And interestingly, Jesus being called the word, right? John opens his gospel with this kind of famous, both theological and philosophical treatise that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That, that Jesus is being called like a, a, something that identifies like a piece of language, right? Now, for the New Testament writers, this would have immediately sent them into thinking about like Greek and this kind of idea of the thing which sort of underlies and holds together all things. Um, logos is the Greek word, um, which is also the word for word, right? So there's, there's sort of a multi-layeredness to that. Um, but I want us to go back to, to imagining like, here's a God who's been speaking, but then when Jesus comes, right, there's this sense that this is the, the, the word, right, the word, the speech of God, the word of God, right, and so even when we sort of call scripture the word of God, I remember being super confused about that for like longer than I felt like I was allowed to be, um, because we would call scripture the word of God, and then it was like, but it's Jesus, the word of God, like the, the concept is more like the revelation of God, right? So Jesus is the revealedness, the revealed one, right? The one who God um, allows us to see and experience and know. And in doing so is the final like expression of God's revelation. And we'll talk about what that means, like final, um, but the most important kind of central uh, piece of who God is and who God is, of course, amongst his people, right? So um, in the incarnation. All right, so then we get the question of like, what, what in the world does that mean for us? And we end up back at the question of like, what does it mean that God is still speaking? We'll come back here for a second, uh, after a second. But I, I think this is, this is kind of my, the, the thing I want us to be thinking about. What can we expect now? Like from where we sit on the other side of Jesus, like what can believers in Jesus expect about the, the God who speaks, right? Or hearing God's voice. Um, I think sophomores and juniors are studying Acts um, in Bible course this semester. Um, Pentecost happens in Acts 2. Um, there's this kind of moment where everything changes. And, and I think we rightly talk about the life, death, and resurrection at the as the hinge point of redemptive history or as the, like the most the climactic moment of the story of God in the world. But the thing that changes how we now relate to God as a result of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection is what happens after Jesus ascends, right, goes back up to be with the Father, and the Holy Spirit comes. And it's this profound and wild, crazy, like, moment where all of a sudden, um, those who have been, there's 120 people who have been praying and fasting and waiting, but they're not sure what they're waiting for. And all of a sudden, God's presence falls and it falls on each person. So there's this like vision of, there's a sense of like a tongue of fire, um, whatever that means, a flame right over top of the heads of each of these people. They're out in public. People are super confused. They start speaking and all of a sudden people can understand each other, even who didn't have the same language. Um, but there is this sense of a, a new language being given um, and people are just confused, but so excited. And what 
Peter says in Acts 2 is, hey guys, remember the prophet Joel, who was an Old Testament prophet? He talked about the day that uh, young and old, like poor and rich men and women would all actually have the kinds of experiences of hearing God's voice that only the elite prophets had in the Old Testament. And so all of a sudden, this experience of God's voice that felt super specialized, really intense, you know, um, accompanied by a lot of warning and a lot, like, ends up in the pocket of all those who believe in Jesus. So the presence and the speech of God, right, or the voice of God uh, becomes democratized starting at Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit becomes the identifier of all those believe, who believe there's no favoritism. Uh, there is this fascinating dynamic of like the Holy Spirit sort of like being at its best when like people are gathered. And we'll talk about that. Um, interestingly, there is still an expectation of obedience. So there's this sense of like, oh my goodness, God's here. He's present. This is awesome. Like he feels more tame, more accessible. Um, and then in Acts 5, um, there's kind of a, a wonky, frightening scene um, where some people try to deceive. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's not good. If you want to be uh, challenged, check out Acts 5. If you're in Bible course, um, you'll check it out anyway. So this sense of like, okay, after the Holy Spirit, what do we like, what can we now as believers on this side of the spirit expect? All right. So to each is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, right? Or the spirit um, for, does anybody know how this ends? This is actually from 1 Corinthians 12. Like, this is like, right? Like the purpose of why those who say yes to Jesus have been given the Holy Spirit. can't see the chat box. I'm going to have to speak. Dun, dun, dun. So the answer is the common good. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit. Why? For the common good. So what that means is I've been given the Holy Spirit for Anna and for Jade and for Tyler and for Don and Owen's been given the Holy Spirit, right? For Felix and like, like we have all been given the Spirit, not for our own sort of spiritual maturity, not for our own like self-improvement project, not even for our own desire for intimacy with the Lord. Although all of those things are, you know, true, like, but, but. Paul in 1 Corinthians says the point of the spirit is actually for the good of others. That that in the same way that Jesus comes to lay his life down, right? Like he pours himself out for others, that the Holy Spirit is actually um, enables us to that end as well. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is a great place to land on all of this stuff, but um Chapter 14 starts with this, pursue love, right? He's just talked about, hey guys, like this is all for the common good. And then chapter 13 is that famous love chapter that gets read at weddings all the time. And then, and then the transition point is in light of what I've just told you, in light of like love before everything else, love instead of, you know, if you have to choose, always choose love. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. And then he says this, especially that you may prophesy. The one who prophesies speaks to people for the upbuilding and it, for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. That chapter is kind of contrasting prophecy with tongues, not because the, if, not because, and we, we're not going to go down this rabbit hole, but not because tongues are bad, but because Paul um, is encouraging God's people 
to use their mouths and their connection to God by the Holy Spirit in order to serve one another. And so he, I, I was telling the staff earlier today, it's kind of like tongues is a little bit like CS50. So if you have taken CS50, if you got the shirt or whatever, um, and you walk around with it, like other people who have taken CS50 are like, that's awesome. You know, or at least they're like, I know what that is. Or maybe they have flashbacks that are like, you know, PTSD. But like any of the above, they at least have a reference point. Prophecy is more like the campus tour, right? It is the like point of entry for any and everyone. It is the, here are all the best things about Harvard and um, isn't this a great place? And look at like the gift to the world that Harvard has been. And um, we're so glad you're here and welcome and look at all our best and brightest and nicest students, right? It, it is, prophecy is the, um, the, the sort of best, face forward um, to others, those inside God's family already and those who have yet to, to join. And what is prophecy? Great question, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, it is speech in the broadest sense, by which I mean all of those things we just talked about, metaphor, imagery, dreams, uh, visions, emotion, like a sense of emotion that may be from the Lord that is specifically that is divinely inspired, sourced by the Holy Spirit. And I think safe to say to instruct and strengthen others. You might, there's a scenario in which a prophetic word is a warning, right? Um, or you might have a warning from God for someone else. Even then it is to instruct and to strengthen others, right? That there is this rubric in scripture where it is always for the common good, right? Always for the manifestation, um, always a manifestation for the common good. And, and I hesitated to say this and, and we're gonna practice very shortly. It is also something that carries God's weight and presence. That being said, like, I mean, I've got a lot of stories and, and not all, many of them are not my own. Um, but sometimes like words are just really joyful or fun or um, just, you might feel like that is so inane. I feel like God gave me, you know, something for someone and it just feels like so silly or dumb. Um, so it must not be God. I, I would say, um, what, what I have two goals for HCFA around this question, and then we're going to transition. And they might seem like they're at cross purposes, and here's what they are. I want us to normalize expecting God to speak and listening to his voice. I also want us to normalize the frustration of not hearing or of not hearing when or what you want to hear. Like both of those things I think need to be held together. You might be from a tradition where this just feels so out there in left field and you're like, I do not even, I've never experienced someone praying for me and feeling like they're telling me something from God. Totally fine. There are probably a number of us here who have that experience. That certainly would have been me in college. Um, you might be from a tradition that has, that lands more on the opposite extreme where everybody's got a word all the time. And, um, and that, and that can have its own dangers and challenges. I just want us to, to begin to be thinking about, um, like holding those, both of those pieces in tension. And we want to like, no matter like your level of nervousness, your level of experience, like we're so glad you're here. I'm so excited um, for us to just see what God might want to do together. So um, 
I'm going to tell you a story while I unshare screen. I, I, I also want to remind you um, that, here we go, um, that this is not a test of maturity. So when I started in HCFA, I was like brand new. I had very little experience with anything, even though I grew up in the church um, around any of this. And I was on staff and um, I was teaching a junior Bible course. And uh, there was this girl who was Australian and she had, she was, she had been on the crew team, but she ended up um, having a like very serious back injury. She had come to Christ in high school, but then was like partying when she got to school and just like not involved in community at all. She has this serious back injury and has to have surgery and she has to be like walked. This is weird. I know, but like walked by someone twice a day. And they needed to be guys because they need to like have a certain like strength factor. And so a friend of hers who happened to be an HCFA basically recruited this list of guys to like come by. And they were all HCFA guys as it turned out. And one early on shared his testimony with her and she was like, oh, this is interesting. And so she started asking these guys like, hey, like tell me about Jesus and you. And again, she had some experience. She was a Christian, but wasn't, hadn't been walking with the Lord for a few years. So that happens. She begins to come back to Christ. Um, and she starts hearing God's voice in crazy ways. So she'd be in like the dining hall and she would like just know things about people. And she would, she's amazing, but not like the most, um, she's very direct. So she would go up to people and just, I mean, they would be laid out flat by whatever she said, but she didn't know how to like shepherd the word that she had. Um, and so I remember sitting in the Starbucks in Harvard Square and her telling me this and being like, I don't know what's happening to me. I keep getting these pictures or words about people. And I, I like, she didn't have a name for it. She had no categories. Her family were not believers, nothing. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like I have to help this person with something that I have zero experience in, like personally or in terms of a church tradition. Like I have a theological category and that is it. And it was so sweet over time, the Lord like honed her shepherding and like taught me a lot and taught us a lot together. And God like profoundly used her gift and is continuing to um, she interned for us at HCFA um, and now is like loving the Lord and back in Australia and probably will be like prime minister one day or something. Who knows? Um, but I say that to say like, it's, she was not, it was not a mark of maturity. It was not a mark of desire. It was not like, it was none of those things. It was literally the Holy Spirit just dropping a gift on her. So I say that to say, like, this is not a test of you. Um, it is just a chance for us to um, practice together and listen to the Lord. And so we're going to, before I send you into small groups to do, to, to kind of try, uh, we're going to do it together uh, for one brave soul. Um, so does anybody...